Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Bellicosa, Community Engagement Manager at Wilton Library. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's program on disaster preparedness, a subject which I'm sure is in the forefront of all of our minds. Uh, two quick protocol points. You're coming in muted and with your cameras off. Please keep them both off in the duration of the program. And if you've got questions, you can use the chat box, uh, the chat button you should see on your screen near the bottom probably. So you can send the questions to me, the host, and then I will moderate them and uh, uh, relay them at the end of the program and we'll handle them as many as we can. Try to keep them concise and uh, on the topic. So with that, I'm gonna turn the program over to the Executive Director of the Wilton Library, Elaine Tyloria. Elaine. Thanks, Michael. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I would like to extend a very special welcome to our new residents in Wilton, and we hope you will discover, of course, the Wilton Library, and this is a wonderful community, so welcome. September is selected as Disaster Preparedness Month, and this week is designated as Prepare for Disasters. On behalf of the Wilton Library Board of Trustees and the staff, I would like to extend our special thanks to First Selectwoman Lynn Vanderslice, Police Chief John Lynch, and Fire Chief Jeff Harold. And thanks so much for participating in this program. Most of all, I'd like to say a special thanks to, to them for all they do each day, each and every day, to keep this community safe for us. So without further delay, I will turn the program over to Lynn to tell you a bit about Wilton's emergency operation. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine, and hi, everybody. Um, it's kind of funny when Elaine first um, came to us with the, this idea, it was prior to the tropical storm. So we thought, oh, it will be timely because we'll be heading into storms, never imagining that we would have had the event that we had in August. But uh, so we're very happy to be here and, you know, having just gone through that storm and being in a pandemic, it certainly, um, uh, it, it, it really explains why we need to do this. Um, I just want to give everyone the message that we have a very strong emergency uh, operations team. Um, it's under the leadership of Chief uh, John Lynch, who you'll hear from. He's our emergency management director. Um, it's a very collaborative team. We have great uh, teamwork. I keep using that word team because it's so critical. Um, but we're people who work with each other all the time throughout the year. So we have strong relationships and, um, and that really helps out when you um, get into the situations that we're in now, with, whether it's the pandemic or the storms. And so I hope that you all um, have seen that in um, the experiences that you've had um, with us um, during um, these times. Uh, you know, one of the critical components of um, anytime you have a disaster is preparedness. So, you know, that's important why we're here today. It's not only the preparation that we do as a community, but it's also the preparation um, that we ask you to do as residents that John and Jeff are going to be speaking about. Another important component is communications. And um, we have really tried hard as a community to improve and make communication more accessible in all areas, but particularly during an emergency. So I just wanna to touch on that one uh, thing. I wanna hope that everybody is signed up for um, the town's emergency alerts, but if not, um, I'm just gonna pull that up onto my screen and, and show you how you can do that. All right, I think you should be able to see my page right now. My, uh, and that's the WiltonCT.org homepage. Uh, we, you know, we used to years ago use phone calls, but we found about um, less than 40% of the people actually pick up that phone call. So we think emails are now uh, the better way to go. And obviously if you are all here on a Zoom uh, presentation, uh, you use email, you're comfortable with technology. So if you haven't subscribed, let me just show you how to do how you do that right up here. It's subscribe to eAlerts. It's click on it. It's very easy. 
You come down here, you, you're gonna put your email in, and then what we want you at a minimum to sign up for is this urgent town alerts. That's gonna be notices from the police, but if you scroll down to news and announcements and you sign up right here for town news and announcements, those are the messages that come from me during the uh, any emergency. So if you were signed up, then you know that there was at least a one uh, message a day during the uh, storm emergency. Mo uh, other, many days there were more than one, but at a minimum uh, that will happen. And right now there are uh, town coronavirus e-alerts, which um, are also at least two times a week. So if you're not signed up, please go ahead and do that at the end of this meeting, wiltonct.org. And there's many other things, you know, about town business that you can sign up for, but at least those two um, to be best prepared for an emergency. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, Chief John Lynch. Uh, John uh, began his uh, quick introduction. He began his uh, police career with um, the town of Wilton. So over 30 years with the town of Wilton, you know, worked his way up um, to the chief position a few years ago. And as I said, is also the emergency management director. And uh, Jeff Harold, he's actually our interim uh, fire chief. He um, agreed to come on as an interim for about a month or two and he has now been here for more than a year um, and he will finish up his um, interim position at the end of this month. But uh, Jeff was more than 30 years with uh, Danbury Fire Department and was the chief of the uh, Danbury Fire Department. So I'll hand it over to John and Jeff. Hello, thank you thank very you, much man. for being oh. here tonight. All right, John, lay off. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's it's a pleasure and, and actually an honor to be here to um, kind of go over our emergency preparedness. Um, we're trying to keep it basic and simple um, and relative to our community. Um, there's a lot of information out there, but uh, the uh, Chief Harold and I kind of streamlined it to, to fit within our community. So with that said, I will start and we're going to start with standard preparations. So this, this applies to, um, it would apply to anything, uh, earthquake, hurricane, uh, blizzard, tornado. Um, so we'll start with the, just the standardized preparations that are suggested. So as um, First Select Woman Vanderslice mentioned, um, signing up for emergency alerts. Um, years ago, we had the Yahoo groups and now we've streamlined it into the town's website. So what that, ena that enables our department through dispatch center um, for fire, EMS and police to send out any kind of notices like um, any uh, uh, special hazards or road closures. Some of you may have signed up and did see like the uh, list of hundreds of roads that were closed during the last storm. Um, and then as we cleared a road, we remove it from the list. Um, so you could kind of follow that and get an understanding, um, you know, of, of the hazards and, and um, if they're clear or not. So beginning the preparations for any of these kind of emergencies, um, you know, we suggest you make a list of items um, such as like potable drinking water, uh, food, gasoline, propane generators, um, propane for your grill. Uh, you should always have two tanks. Uh, one is a backup. And so when you run out in the middle of cooking, you have it, but you also have the ability to have two, two tanks for an extended power outage. Um, and then the one caution and you know, Jeff, why don't you just touch on this one? It's about using generators and grills in proximity. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, th that's an issue that shows up every time uh, we have any kind of a situation like this. And indeed, we did have them in Wilton uh, immediately after the storm where people use the generators and the grills too close to an entryway into the home. Uh, and remember, generators and a grill, like anything that burns, creates carbon monoxide. And if you use it too close to the home, uh, the fumes from the generator and the propane will go into your 
uh, get into your living space. And that can create a very serious and sometimes indeed life-threatening situation. So you should, if you're installing a generator, have it installed properly. And there are building codes that apply to generators. Uh, and uh, don't ever use a portable generator like at the door of a garage. Because even if you put it outside, the temperature differential will often bring that exhaust outside into the house, into the garage, and into the living area. And you want to leave it away from uh, windows and doors simply, that, that's obvious. But you also want to consider things like dryer vents. Um, if you have it outside next to the home where you have a dryer vent or even a bathroom vent, uh, you know, any kind of exhaust vents, any entrance way, carbon monoxide can find its way back into the house. So anytime you're using a propane or even a charcoal grill, don't use them on a wooden covered deck and keep them away from the home in, in any way of, of uh, an entrance for the uh, exhaust fumes. Thanks, Jeff. And um, just to add to that, um, I did notice in this last storm, some people actually had tents. So they had the generator out in the uh, driveway and a 10 by 10 tent covering it to protect, protect it from the rain. And um, the other thing is, um, you know, if, if it's touching something, they get very hot, could, could become flammable. Um, and the other issues are food. So with this last storm that we had, it was unique because, um, you know, we had never had Wilton Center go down. And in past storms, we were used to having CLNP crews and, and establishing the priorities. And obviously Wilton Center, um, there's dense housing, there's elderly housing, there's restaurants and groceries, and it's kind of the heartbeat of Wilton um, for supplies. And that was out for a good five or more days. Um, so you wanna stock up on food and supplies and, and not just the bread, milk, and uh, eggs that disappear at the groceries, especially with a snowstorm. Um, but you wanna have supplies, um, canned goods, um, things that you can survive and, and um, feed your family. They suggest um, a minimum of three days, but um, you should always think about a week ahead um, because like this last storm, we were, we were without power for a week and you don't know if restaurants will be available or open. Um, and the other thing is, if you have cold food, um, you know, have a, a large cooler available and, um, you know, ice to keep those items cold. Um, always have a battery operated radio. Now, many of us stream uh, through our phones and that kind of thing, but you never know if a cell tower goes down, you will not have internet access. A lot of people during this last storm lost internet access. So the old fashioned AM FM radio still comes in handy. They're relatively inexpensive. You put them in, a, in your go bag, maybe Jeff will talk about that, and um, extra, extra batteries. Um, one of the most important things for us in Wilton is many of us, um, we don't have sewer or septic or water. So we rely on electricity for that. And if you don't have a generator or your generator is not working or not hooked in, um, you can't flush your toilets. So it's always suggested before a storm is to fill your bathtubs with um, water. So at least you can use that to, um, to flush toilets and maybe clean some stuff. Um, Jeff, do you wanna mention uh, what the fire department offered or we'll get into that in resources, I'm sorry. Um, and then, you know, obviously uh, simple things, obvious things like keep a flashlight, batteries, extra warm clothing or blankets in your vehicle. Um, Jeff, you want to talk about first aid kits and take it from there? Yeah, uh, first aid kits, and, and along with the first aid kits, and it'll, I'll touch on it again with the go bag. Uh, the first aid kit is your standard kit, you know, your antibacterial spray or, or the ointment, uh, band-aids, some basic bandages, and then anything that's specific to you and or your family's needs, uh, and including that would be uh, if, you, if you've got uh, people that are um, allergic to certain things. You want to have both the medications that you would need for that, but also, you know, the, the bug spray, for example, should be part of your first aid kit because, uh, you know, this particular storm came in the middle of warm weather and the bugs are, are very prevalent. And if you're, uh, you know, outside or you have to be traveling or whatever, and you're going to either leave or evacuate and go out 
and you're going to be outside. So if you have bug bites, you're going to have to have the treatments for that. So remember, first aid kit is really a seasonal thing. It changes. It's different in the winter because in the winter, it might include a nice warm fleece blanket, for example. Um, and then uh, along with your first aid kits, in addition to that, your meds for yourself. And, you know, I, I like to go for a week uh, with, the, with the first aid kits and the medications and the foods. So I use that seven day time frame, and we did have people in Wilton that were without for I think nine days, right, was the last power restoration. So it, it can last a while. Um, and then, you know, the final thing with the first aid kit is also remember first aid for your pets. If your pets are traveling with you, you know, they may need certain things too, both of their medication, as well as anything that you might need for them if they're on, uh, uh, you know, or get injured or something along the way. So keep them in mind too, because they are a member of the family and sometimes that aspect gets forgotten. Um, and then uh, right after that, I see on the bullet point is fire extinguishers, knowing how to use them. If you have a fire extinguisher in your home and you don't know how to use it, it's like a tool that you don't know how to use and it, it would be important to learn. Um, and if you were to come to the firehouse, for example, we can teach you how to use it. We'll actually, or, uh, we can run the class for you. We can run classes for the public uh, and teach you how to use a, a fire extinguisher because there is a specific proper use uh, format for a fire extinguisher. Um, and if you do have one, make sure they're up to date and they're uh, compliant with current um, needs in your, in your home. For example, if you have a, uh, uh, a gas stove or, or any kind of uh, uh, an extinguisher in your garage, um, you might need a different type of extinguisher there versus one that you would have normally in the house for, say, a Class A fire. Um, John, go ahead. You want to pick up with the cell phones? Yeah. Um, so cell phones, as some of us experienced, we lost internet. Um, some of the towers were up and down um, and, you know, batteries run out. And so the, uh, the backup batteries to charge your phones are relatively inexpensive these days. And... Um, you know, like I personally have a couple plugged in all, at all times, so I know I'm good. You can also use your car to charge them and that kind of thing. Um, if you use the car, don't run it in the garage. In the garage, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny though, some, some obvious things, but some things you, you may not think of. And the other, you know, with that, Jeff, is uh, CO, right? And CO poisoning, it's, Absolutely. you don't smell it. There's no odor to it. There's so no you, order to it. And you might, what you smell, for example, when you smell the exhaust from a car, you smell the unburned particles. You're not smelling carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is almost neutral to air, so it can move to any part of the house. Um, you, you'll find it in the basement to the attic. And it could come from automobiles, your gas grill, your generator, or it could come from your oil furnace if it was indeed running. Uh, if it misfires and fires incorrectly, you can still put CO in. And we had a number of cases during this storm response that were involving with CO alarms sounding due to all of these things I just listed. So be aware of what the CO is and, and install CO detectors. They're relatively inexpensive. You can buy them at hardware stores or the big box stores. You can get them just about anywhere. Great. Um, and the one thing, I, the other thing I wanted to mention about the medications and, and having a week's worth during this last storm, we did receive a few calls as well as social services that they couldn't access the CVS in Wilton to pick up their prescriptions because they didn't have power for five days. So, so those are some things that um, we need to think about, um, you know, when we, these storms are uh, prevalent. Um, so we'll move on to knowing how to turn off your water and electricity. Everybody should go through that drill. Um, and just know how to turn off your main power um, from the fuse, know where the fuse box is, and also your, your main water shutoff. You never know when a pipe may burst, but sometimes with these storms, you may have a tree limb come down and take something out. Um, so you should always just understand where and what it is and, and how to do it. Um, and I know we're, uh, we wanna leave enough time to, um, you know, for people to ask questions. So I'm gonna move through this relatively fast. Um, clearing trees and branches from around your home, I think that's self-explanatory, but you don't want to wait till a, a storm comes to uh, have that big oak tree that's been dead for three years fall through your roof and either, you know, hurt somebody or, or, or you know, damage your home. Um, and that, that includes large branches and that kind of thing. Um, 
when a storm comes, you, you should remain inside the house. Um, don't go out, don't run to the store, just wait till it passes. If it's a larger storm, predicted hurricane or such, um, you know, it'll vary track wise and you know, you need to stay in your home and, and be prepared to uh, stick it out. Um, downed wires, I'll let you cover that, Jeff. Please. Okay. I, I noticed that the big letters do not go any, near anywhere down wires. Don't go near any wire, even if you think it's a telephone or a cable. Uh, always assume they're live as, as, and, and know that they can become re energized and then they'll move around. They'll jump around. One of the, the best stories, examples of this, and this refers to a fire department um, don't go in near any, any down wires because remember, electricity travels. It's not just in the wire, it could be uh, in the ground. And depending on the voltage that's coming down from the line, from the pole, you could be standing on the ground and get an electric buzz as far as 40 or 30 or 40 feet away from where it's contacting the ground, depending on the voltage. One of the things that happened to a firefighter in, in my previous assignment in Danbury was we were over 100 yards away from where the wires were down and it was arcing and making a dance in the road. But the wire was also touching an electric fence that was right next to where the fire truck parked and not thinking or not paying attention, one firefighter did go over and lean against the electric fence and yes, it was charged. And it was a hundred yards away and it didn't hurt in the, the, uh, you know, the long-term sense, but it gave him a jolt and it's something he's never forgotten. Um, and so electricity can travel. And one of the examples and one of the reasons for this, by the way, is on all the electric poles, you'll see a cable that is wrapped in or involved with holding the wires up. And that cable is of course metal. And if there's a short and it gets to that cable, that cable can run it both directions from that short and really carry the power a long way. So don't touch wires in any way, shape or form, even if you think they're dead, because the fact that they're quiet doesn't mean that they are. Yeah, and I, and I just wanna to add to that. Um, they could be quiet, they could be de-energized but I've also seen them where they became energized. Um, there are some automatic circuits that will try to re-energize to burn off a, a tree limb or something on the wires. So you just, you just assume, always assume that there is power. And with that, um, you know, I made this mistake uh, back in the eighties when I was a rookie, you know, I'm looking ahead to look at the downed wires and I actually stepped on one because they're hard to see. Some are bare copper, um, some are, are dark, Many times they're entangled in tree limbs and you're focused up ahead. Um, you know, watch where you're walking, watch what you're touching and uh, always stay away from wires. Um, and then the other part, part to that at down wires, it, it does happen, it's rare, but it does happen where wires may fall on a vehicle, a tree and wires. And the recommendation is stay in the car, don't get out and call 911 immediately. And they, uh, the power company makes that a priority um, life and death priority, and they'll respond immediately. Um, let's see. Secure loose items out, outdoors. That's pretty self-explanatory. Grills, patio furniture, tents, um, anything that might blow away. Um, be prepared and identify anyone with medical needs to the utility company and social services. So Wilton Social Services has a list of people who may require um, special needs or, or needs, um, could be medical, could be otherwise. Um, it's a confidential list. And you can also uh, sign in with Eversource as um, somebody who needs uh, electricity as a priority to uh, facilitate, um, you know, like oxygen machines and that kind of thing. Um, Make sure you have enough of your prescribed medication. We talked about that. Um, backing up of computers. Um, you know, nowadays, every, a lot of things are in the cloud and, and so that's not as important. But if you have, um, you know, a computer, back it up on a hard drive and, and be able to take that hard drive with you in case you do need to get out. So if your house is uh, leveled or catches on fire or flooded, um, you know, you, you have access to your backups. And take pictures of a lot of your items. Um, take pictures of your pictures. I know people who have unfortunately have had house fires and lost, you know, all their memories. So 
um, do that before something happens so you have it. Um, be familiar with your area and its susceptibility for flooding. Jeff, you want to cover that real quick? Yeah, uh, if you're in a flood zone or near any kind of a water course, remember, um, for example, in a hurricane, uh, you, you hide from the wind and you run from the water. So water is, is deadly. It, it's amazing how much energy and inertia water can, can bring you down. Six inches of flowing water can knock a grown man down. So it's really important that you keep that familiar with it. it's gonna be flooding. And the general rule is, and this is the rule that we use in the fire service, if you're on the road and you can't see the road markings, you know, the double yellow line, the white line, don't drive on the road because it could be deeper or the road could be gone. It could be washed out. There are some very famous photographs of fire trucks upended in a, in a sinkhole where they thought they were on the road and the road just wasn't there anymore. So be very careful and know where you are and know where the roads are normally susceptible to flooding. And if you can't see the road markings, I strongly advise you not to try to drive through the puddle. And then you would cover the next one as well. Uh, oh, yeah, candles, yeah, that, that's in my bailiwick. Um, don't use candles in general. Candles are great for, for uh, you know, setting the mood or, or, or for uh, ambiance, but they, they should not be used to replace lighting in, a, in an environment where, especially with there's children or where they can get tipped over. Uh, anything with an open flame is a danger to begin with. And, and so in a situation like this, we strongly urge that you don't use candles to replace lighting in these circumstances. Good point. And then the last one on the preparation list is um, just kind of have a plan in place if you had to move your family somewhere, um, friends, relatives, um, just kind of have a plan there um, and not just your family, but your pets as well. And many of us experienced uh, with Katrina in New Orleans, um, they, they had a lot of pets there and it was, it was a big issue. And, and many of us were ill prepared or not prepared at all to deal with pets. And so now by law, we do have to, and you know, we have spare crates and set up shelters. So just know um, what your shelter Op um, options are and um, you know bring bring your portable crates for your dog and medications foods and toys but Jeff will talk about a go bag which covers most of that and that's coming up now so okay you'll notice that much of what we've talked about is what happens before the event many of those things can be done now whether there's an event even in the near future or not um, and, and so we, we urge you to be prepared at some level all the time for an emergency. And that's really what this is. So keeping a go bag, a go bag is a bag that an individual has to get up and get out now. If you've get noticed that, for example, that the hurricane changed course and you've got three hours to hit the road and, and go someplace else, you should have a go bag ready to go. And that should be basic clothes, medications, water for a couple of days, uh, food for your pets, food for yourself, batteries again, some of this is we're going to repeat, batteries for your portable radio, uh, a, a phone charger with a spare battery charger, uh, your credit cards, got to have those, cash, your phone list, that's important. If you don't have your cell phone or if your cell phone battery dies, what's on Ellis's number? I don't know. Maybe it's, I can't remember. So have a paper list of the important phone numbers for yourself. Portable light and batteries as well there. By the way, some of these radios and batteries, they have a hand crank generator now that you can, you don't need batteries in it. You can crank it and it's good for 15 or 20 minutes at a time after cranking it either for the light or the battery. And it gives you that emergency communications and lighting. And develop contact times and a plan with family and friends. In the event there's an emergency happening and you have to leave, have a plan before the emergency, what time or when you're gonna to try to call your relatives or your friends to let them know where you are. One of the worst things is that being okay and not knowing if you can get that information to somebody or being on the other end and not knowing if you're okay. If you have a plan and a set time, they know that, okay, it's not five o'clock, they're supposed to try to get me at five o'clock. Now, so obviously sometimes even those plans can fall apart, but if you have a plan and a schedule, it makes everybody's nervous tension a little less. Um, and then you wanna have specific needs. So some of these things in a go bag 
are, are going to be warm clothes in the winter. I don't need my big woolly jacket now in, in July or August, but I might need, you know, a light fleece or something. In the wintertime, I want that big jacket. And then you want to harden the home. And we were talking about some of that earlier. Um, you want to have your home prepared for the disaster at all times. Right now, for example, where the wildfires are, one of the things that they've taught people when they build homes is to not let flammable uh, brush and bush get too close to the house. They'll want trees that'll transfer the fire from the tree to the brush to the home. So you're hardening your home, it's a term that's used to make your home more secure, whether it's security systems or moving that pine tree that's so pretty right outside your living room door. Um, remove the trees, the branches. Once again, check your generators and gas. Oh, and by the way, one other thing is, if you're storing spare propane tanks, make sure you store them properly. Tanks now have a fail-safe system in there so that gas won't come out unless it's connected. However, it is still a flammable and sometimes explosive object, so store them properly in a place where they can't be damaged. Check your auto and your tires and your gas. Make sure if you're going to be leaving, make sure the car is ready to go. And then consider your own physical capabilities and condition. If you are somehow unable to, for example, uh, cut a branch away from the garage door, you may have to have some help or have other ways to get that done. Be aware that some things you can't shovel that snow all the time after a blizzard. And, and understand that you have to take care of yourself to take care of your family and those loved ones that you're responsible for. And then uh, finally, if you are getting ready for an event, contact your friends and family, tell them what your plans are, where you plan to go, whether you're gonna stay in your home or whether you're gonna try to make it to a hotel or head out of the hurricane or the storm's path. And then if it comes down to it and you have to evacuate, you'll be ready to evacuate. John, you wanna take up some of the next? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add, um, I think we should all, um, go into this with the understanding that emergency services may not be able to reach you or they may be significantly delayed. There were several streets, um, one, one of which we had to walk through the woods for a mile to get to for a good five or more days. So, you know, God forbid there was a fire or, or ambulance call. Um, there's not much emergency services was able to do. Yeah, and that, that unfortunately is, is a common occurrence. And by the way, sometimes it's not even after the storm. During the storm, once the winds get to 40 or 50 miles an hour, we don't put fire trucks on the road. It's too dangerous for the personnel responding. So at some point, even during a heavy storm, while it's actually happening, we may not be able to come out on the road to even if you roads are clear, we may not be able to get there. Yeah, and, and with that, some of our... Uh fire uh, trucks and police cars have, have been trapped um, during some of these storms. Um, so it is dangerous. So if you're out there driving around and, and one other storm where you should not be on the road is during a heavy snowstorm. Because if, if a car gets stuck, then the plows can't get through and then it just piles up. And um, so be cognizant of that. Try not to drive when it's snowing, stay home. Um, and I noticed that Wilton does a good job with that for the most part. Um, so let's see, we covered uh, pending event um, during the event. Um, if, you're, if you're evacuating, and I'm just gonna go through this because we're about, um, about 25 minutes left. So we wanna leave time for questions. So make sure you have your maps, uh, your GPS and your destination, go bags, pets, um, leave before the danger arrives, uh, usually 24 hour minimum for like a hurricane or that kind of thing have a planned route and notify others of your planned evacuation route and destination. That way, if something does happen, somebody else knows um, you know, what your plans were. If you're staying home, um, Jeff, you want if you could just cover that. I think yeah, that real was quickly, your... if you're gonna stay at home and you're going through a hurricane, for example, be aware of a couple of things. Hurricanes can create weapons of common everyday things. For example, we talked about the patio chairs. A uh, hurricane can pick that up and throw that through a window. So if you're inside and you can't board up your windows, avoid rooms with big windows, avoid glass, stay into an inside room with as few windows as possible, or put furniture in front of the window so in case something happens. Use it again, using your portable generators appropriately, have that food in there ready to go. 
and, and you know, um, be aware that emergency services might not get to you. We have to stress that because you could be trapped there for a while as a result of the storm. You may be perfectly fine, but the roads are blocked and we can't get to you. So please have your meds and have your ability to take care of yourselves as much as possible. So after the event, um, you know, Jeff had already mentioned, don't shovel too much. Again, you know, if, if you drop of a heart attack or something or hurt yourself, slip and fall, you know, the ambulance may not be able to get you to, uh, quickly. Um, you know, let family members know that you're safe. Use your resources, water food judiciously. Um, notify the power company if you're out. Most people have that app if it's working. Um, you may not get an ETR. That was a little sarcasm, but... Um, you know, hopefully you, they'll, they'll be notified. And then, you know, again, wait, wait for the trucks to clear the roads before you, you know, go out. And then as Jeff had it here, he said, make sure you don't eat all the chocolate chip cookies the first day. Yeah. All right. My emergency rations, my Pepper's yeah. Farm chocolate chip cookies. So we're going to run through town services and resources just so you know what's available. Um, you know, obviously we have the emergency response of all the services during the event. Um, we, we will activate the emergency operations center, um, with, uh, first select woman Vanderslice and the department heads. Um, we already covered the town of Wilton emergency notifications. We have public works who does a fantastic job and they have all the, the equipment needed, uh, clearing roadways. Um, we work with Eversource to try to make safe, not so much this storm, but in prior storms and we're pursuing to, to ensure that we have them if we have another storm, but to work with the crews and uh, cut the, the trees across the roads, move the wires so people can get in and out and emergency equipment. Um, we have a, a fantastic CERT team. They are, are built to be the best in the state. Um, I, I want to say their numbers are, are in the 70s and, and growing. Um, they have plenty of equipment and they alleviate a lot of stress and um, man hours from all the emergency departments. They set up detour signs, they will direct traffic. Um, you know, they'll operate 24 hours a day. So there's a lot of resources with CERT on a regional level as well. Um, emergency sheltering, CERT also facilitates that with the health department and social services. Um, and now it incorporates pets, which is our animal control officer uh, handles. Um, you know, we have communication with Homeland Security Region 1. That's part of my role with the emergency management. Um, so we have 14 uh, communities that um, are in Region 1 and we can share resources. Um, also state resources through that. Um, we've opened up, uh, especially this last storm, uh, warming, cooling, and charging stations, depending on the weather. Um, Lynn did a fantastic job with, you know, getting those up and running. Uh, normally we would use the Wilton Library or the YMCA. Uh, YMCA has shower abilities and, and they're more than uh, open to the public in times of uh, emergencies. Unfortunately with COVID, it created a lot of, um, a, a lot of difficulties in trying to do that safely. Um, but you'll notice that the town offered um, internet services at the schools and the public buildings. So that's something that's new this time around and, and we plan to do that in future emergencies. Um, shower facilities, I covered that quickly. Um, water supply, Jeff, that's yours. You wanna run through the rest of them? And we're under, let's see. Yeah, I see it. water supply. Um... The water supplies, when, when you don't have water at home, and water is more important than food, uh, then you, if you come to the firehouse here at headquarters this, this time around for the storm, we did put out a, a manifold is what we call it, and it allowed people to come in with uh, five hoses off of the hydrant to be able to fill water bottles. Now, obviously that requires that the people coming here have their own water bottles or vessels, and whether it's gallon jugs or you know a five gallon jerry can, to uh, fill it up. And by the way, I saw some very interesting water bottles down here, open barrels, open, open five gallon buckets, um, a World War II, I think, jerry can from the back of a Jeep. Um, it was amazing what they were carrying to get water to them. But water is, is critical. So you have to have some way to get it. And uh, 
you know, one of the things that we noticed here, we used that water right up until the Saturday after the storm or Sunday after the storm. A lot of people needed water because if you lose power, your wells go down and your well pump doesn't work. So that's an important thing. So have water on there, fill up your bathtubs, have another supply. You can buy these inflatable or um, expandable water containers and fill them up before the storm and give you some, at least a few days of working water. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and thanks for providing that service. Um, so we have um, limited time. So I'm just gonna run through the one, we have different storms. We have um, hurricanes, tornadoes, blizzard and ice storms, um, flooding, power outages in general, and earthquakes. So I think the one that I'm just gonna hit on because we've kind of covered everything already um, are tornadoes. So we, we dodged a bullet uh, a couple of weeks ago with uh, those st strong cells that came through. We received a call from our uh, regional director uh, warning us. And so we put the alert out. Um, it should have been a tornado coming through Wilton, but thankfully it, it didn't cause uh, nearly any of the damage that we were expecting. Um, but, but if you find yourself in, in one of these snap storms or tornadoes, Try to find a parking lot with no, you know, with no trees around out in the open, so um, nothing can fall on you, and you're not driving through uh, water that you can't see the bottom of the road. Um, usually, with tornadoes, um, they're localized, so there's a lot of re there are a lot of resources in the state of Connecticut. So if Wilton gets hit, we can rely on our, our uh, surrounding towns and, and the state as well. Whereas in a hurricane, usually it's, it's a much broader area, so you have to rely on uh, other states and unaffected areas. Um, but with tornadoes, you'll, you'll notice many of you will get the alert on your cell phone. Just take that seriously, because that, that is um, keying off of a regional tower for that area. So just make sure if, if you get that alert, make sure you pay attention to it and get to a safe area. And if you're at home, um, usually a basement, um, stay away from the windows and that kind of thing. So I'm, I think we're gonna skip, Jeff, if you agree. Is there anything yeah. else that you think is um, specific? I think, I think we've covered just about all yeah. aspects, at least generally. Um, no, I'm, I'm fine with this, yes. Okay. And, and Michael and Elaine said they would send out um, a copy of this uh, PowerPoint. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out to uh, Jeff or, or me um, at our Wilton addresses. We're online. So please, anytime. Okay, thanks. That was, that was great. Very informative. Uh, we do have a few questions, so I'll pass them on. I just want to mention a couple of things that, yes, um, if you signed up for this, we sent you the outline that we just went through. Um, we at the library have curated a set of, of online resources that we're going to post on our website probably as soon as tomorrow that includes variety of local state and federal sources of information it includes the the pdf that you got earlier today um, and it's also going to include maybe as soon as tomorrow a link to the recording of this program so we'll have that there uh, very soon maybe as early as tomorrow so a um, couple of questions in the case of tornadoes so if you're driving in your car What's the safest thing to do? Do you pull over immediately? Do you stay away from certain areas or buildings? Okay, so Jeff, I'll, let me just cover that real quick um, because I knew that question would come up. Um, some people say drive to an underpass or overpass and stay underneath it. Um, that's actually worse because the, the winds can multiply. Um, what I read um, was that you should if you can turn around, if, if, if you can see which way the tornado, if you're heading towards the tornado, turn around and go the other way. Um, some say, well, hide in a ditch. Well, that's, that's a last resort. You don't want to do that. If there's a structure nearby that you can access, preferably something that's strong, um, you know, use that as cover. If you have to, um, they say, if you can't move, let's say you're stuck in traffic or whatever, just um, make sure you secure yourself in your vehicle. Um, vehicles offer uh, some protection. Make sure you're seat belted and any loose items are either, um, I would put them outside or, or, you know, make sure they're not flying around if your car is affected. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, 
So after the comments earlier about fire extinguishers, Jeff, someone asked, how do I update existing fire extinguishers? Oh, okay. Um, one of the things you can do, if, if they're a plastic fire extinguisher, if they're all plastic, they generally just have to be thrown out. Once they're past their date, they, they can't be. They're metal fittings, the metal fitting ones, like a five pound uh, uh, extinguisher that you can buy at Home Depot. And you can have those uh, updated, upgraded. Um, what they'll do is they'll take them, empty them, charge them up and test them. And what they do, they call it, they call it a hydro test where they put it under pressure to make sure that the container of the extinguisher uh, is uh, still safe to use. And then they'll just recharge it, put the air in it to uh, use it and give it back to you. And, and they'll have a new tag on it and they can do that. Um, and though you can find fire safety companies around the state that do that. Thanks, Jeff. So someone who's asking about types of generators, either could you talk about different types of generators or any recommendations of types of generators? Generators. Oh, go ahead, go ahead John. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't make recommendations in that respect. What I will recommend is if you do get a generator, make sure an electrician installs the, um, you know, the wiring for the house. Some people would just plug in refrigerators, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, it should be done by an electrician and it should be a certified, um, installation expert. Jeff, go ahead. If you have. Uh, no, I was going to say is this pretty much the same thing. If you're going to install a generator with a double throw, double pull switch to cut it off from the street power, that has to be done by a licensed electrician. And once again, that's a, a, a permit. You have to pull a permit to have that done. If you're going to use a simple generator to run an extension cord to run your refrigerator, just once again, keep it far enough away from any openings into the house because that generator is going to generate some carbon monoxide and some exhaust and just keep it as uh, safe as you can, put it in this environment where the exhaust is not coming into the house. Those small generators, gasoline, you can get them propane, you can get them natural gas, you can even get a diesel generator. But the diesel generators and the natural gas tend to be those that are permanently installed, which re will require a permit and an electrician and, and uh, you know, a process to build them. They are the best, and you can get a whole house generator that'll power your whole house in the event of a storm. But they also probably cost ten thousand or more because well, you have propane. Well, yeah, depending on the on the height, the size of the generator. Yeah, they can vary from anywhere from four thousand to, to, as he said, ten thousand or more even. Okay, great. So someone commented that the idea of a fire extinguisher class at the fire at the fire station is a great idea. Could you talk a little more about how that how that works? Well, we've actually we do them for industry, and we have done them in the past. Um, uh, in, in the past here. Uh, we haven't done one in the last year or so. Um, but if, for example, if we had a request for them at any time, if somebody were to call up and down there, it, within a few days, we can put together a demonstration and a class on how to use an extinguisher. We can do that pretty readily. Um, and, and indeed, if there's an extinguisher in your house and you are at all uncertain as to how to use it, they all should come with an instruction manual but it's a real simple system and we can bring it, if you bring it down to us, set up, call up, we'll set up a time and we'll go over it with you. It's, it's easy to do. Can I just Great. add one little piece there? Um, we're not gonna do a class during COVID. So uh, yeah, no, <laughs> let's qualify this. We're not having a lot of visitors to the fire station during COVID, but I do think it's a great idea and maybe something that the library, you know, let's coordinate it. And yeah. um, you know, sure. uh, once we get past COVID. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I did see a chat question about how to determine different wires on the pole. Uh, somebody was asking about um, cable wires versus phone wires versus electrical wires. And it, with all due respect, it's something I, I don't, you, you don't really, I, they don't matter. Teach them all the same, treat them all the same as if they're live power. Um, generally, however, the electric wires are at the top of the pole, then there's telephone wires, then there's cables below that. If you can see where it's attached to the pole, it might give you a generally a general idea, but that doesn't mean that it's not shorted out at the pole and electricity isn't leaving the electrical wires and getting into a cable. Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen um, houses burn um, back feeding through a uh, telephone or cable. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so, I did want to mention that CERT, um, they do, if, if you are interested in being a CERT member, 
you know, they do teach you first aid, which I think every citizen should have basic first aid knowledge. I was an EMT for years, but I, I will carry that knowledge to, you know, for the rest of my life, um, basic first aid. And they also have a, I think a fire extinguisher component and a traffic component and, um, you know, how to be safe around wires and that kind of thing. So it's also Great, thank you. So one, uh, one last question, unless we get uh, any, any more, something that actually I found helpful in the last big storm, but one of you guys could comment on it a little better than I could. Um, with the importance of water, what about using swimming pool water and hot tub water for different things? Yeah, actually, uh, swimming pool or hot tub water certainly could be used to flush your toilets. Um, you would want to be careful that there's not so much bromine in it that it's going to upset your septic system. Obviously, that's a concern. Um, but yeah, water like that you can use for that type of sanitation. It is not potable. You can't drink it. And it's very difficult to make drinkable in a short time in the average household. Thanks, Jeff. Well, I think that wraps up the questions in the chat box. Um, I don't know if Lynn or Elaine wants to make any concluding comments. This was really very, very informative. Yeah, I just, I, I can't thank all of you for, you know, uh, taking time out of your days um, uh, to prepare this program and, and to present it. And really for all you do, I have learned so much. And as you know, I've gone through lots of storms here and yet I picked up so many wonderful nuggets. So I can't thank you enough. And I just want to say, Michael, you had mentioned that we'll be um, storing some resources on our website, but this um, video, will also be available. And as we um, face other storms coming through, we'll be e-blasting that so that it will, you know, be there to help people be prepared and hopefully be safer. And the one website I'd like to get out there is the FEMA site, ready.gov. And it's the site that will lead you to any other links for any of these other questions and a lot of other information. It's a simple site. and. FEMA's have put that together and they keep it updated and they, they will give you a ton of information through that site and other links it connects to. We'll and the, ready dot, the links to a couple of parts of ready.gov, <clears throat> excuse me, are in the, uh, the set of uh, resources we're putting together to, that we'll post on the library's webpage. Yeah, and even this Connecticut guide will be there. That as too. Well. Yeah. And uh, Lynn, I neglected to mention, I have it in here as the last thing I wanted to cover was the C-click fix. I don't know if you were gonna say a few words before we close out. Uh, go ahead, John. You can go no, ahead. I, I'll, I'll let you describe it. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> it was your idea. So. <laughs> because C-click fix is one of my favorite things. Um, so um, we ha if you're not familiar, uh, C-click fix is an issue reporting system. There's also a behind the scenes piece that the public doesn't see, which is a work order system. So um, any issue in, a, in an emergency situation or post emergency for down trees or down wires that, you know, um, non 911 um, situations, you can just enter that information in through C Click Fix. And behind the scenes, it's routed directly to DPW or police or whoever needs to address it. So it's a fantastic system. You can uh, access it again on the town website. Um, there, uh, when you go on the home page, there's a resident section, and right under there is a link uh, for C Click Fix. You can download it onto your phone. Uh, beauty of it is you can take a picture on your phone and then um, send that off to um, us. So it, the, the phone comes with the, uh, the picture rather comes with the coordinates. So we know where that picture is. When you send it up, you put an address. So it's, it's um, a faster way for you to communicate with us and you don't need a person at the other end of the line answering a phone, but it's also a much more um, efficient means for us to address issues. And then you get to track your issues. So you'll see uh, when it's been resolved. But thanks, John, for mentioning that. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Uh, wrapped it up right on time, covered a lot of things. And uh, you, can, you can give the library a, a call or, or send us an email if you have a follow-up question. Or as, uh, as John said, you can contact them and, and follow up with that. But uh, we'll keep the information current and uh, I'm glad you could join us. All right.
Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And thanks, Jeff. You're immortalized. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> all right.